What up, though? This is the Free Game Producer Podcast. My name is Brian Andre, and I've got the super producer, the multi-platinum producer, the big homie Willpower. What's up, baby? What up, man? What it do, bro? Man, it's a blessing to be here, man. It's a blessing to be back talking music production and music business. You know what I'm saying? First thing I want to say, man, is um, our prayers, man, and thoughts go out to everybody in um, Houston, Texas. That's crazy, That's dealing with uh, Hurricane Harvey. Yeah, I think I read somewhere it was like I think 14 trillion gallons of water or something like that. That's crazy, man. Touched down, man, and, and people are, um, you know, kind of stuck out there. Yeah, you know? I hit up a couple of my friends, man, that live out that way just to see if they were good, man. And you know, part of me was hoping that that they would say something to me like, "Nah, I didn't, I didn't hit me. I, I'm good," you know. But you know, instead they sent pictures saying, "Yeah, man, it's jammed up." You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, definitely uh, sending prayers out for those people, man. And major yeah. shout outs to like the brave people who are like doing their thing to try to help out. Yeah, you know it, it's people just just drove with boats, just drove. Yeah. And, and had a boat in the back of their truck and just, just kind of got busy. Up. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? So what's up, man. Shout out to them, man. It's, it's kind of good. You know, like the thing that's like kind of good about this thing is like you, you finally get to see that, uh, you know, there are times, man, where people come together. It doesn't matter. You know exactly. what the race is or exactly. whatever like it's a good thing for us to be in that type of position too you know to see that so exactly it's always a good look you know what i'm saying yeah so shout out to them man and, and prayers and you know if you can help help you know what i'm saying you know we know music uh definitely helps you know what i'm saying in general you know what i'm saying kind of kind of heal different things going on man and right. it's a lot to talk about with music you know what i'm saying some new music came out this week yeah it seems like you know this has been a great year for albums, you know what I'm saying? A great yeah. year for albums. And right, right. Not saying this weekend was really great, but but it's up to you to decide whether you I think mean, it's great it or not. it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that but awesome to me, but it was. <laughs> my point is that a lot of stuff came out, man. Um, ASAP Mob yeah. came out with a Cozy Takes Volume 2. Right. And, you know, those guys have been putting out a lot of music lately. I mean, uh, you know, ASAP 12, he had his album come out a couple weeks ago. Right. Um, ASAP Ferg had his quote unquote mixtape album right. come out last weekend and then this that's like three projects within like a, a 30 day time span right, you know right, what I'm right. saying so that came out and you've got producers on there like um uh let's see um a lot of folks on here I'm trying to look at the production credits man but you got a lot of folks you got uh who was on here man uh, RZA did that joint on here RZA Hit Boy which is crazy man yeah. cause you know like one of the things that the ASAP Mob was always screaming was that they're the best group ever out of New York like yeah. even over the Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang. so that's well, kinda yeah. dope well I think they kinda maybe the new ver- the new version yeah cause they remind me of Wu-Tang because I keep hearing members come out of nowhere like 12 I didn't even know who 12 was you right, know what right, I'm saying right. like how Wu-Tang you had members like Capadonna or, or you know Master Killer different people come Come up, come up out of nowhere who was part of the crew so yeah. it's a pretty good project man um you know they got a lot of good um features on there i think big sean's on a couple of records man Sick. schoolboy q is on a on the record uh gucci man is on the record as well man playboy right. cardi is on like three or four records right. jaden smith is back again you know jaden smith was on uh, tyler's album he had a little cameo on his album so i don't know if if uh will smith's son is, is getting to the rap game but but he's on there man right I think Frank Ocean is on the track as well. So, you know, it's Cozy Takes Volume 2, man. Um, you know, so that that came out. Um, Luzi, I'm uh, sorry, Luzi. <laughs> Lil Uzi Vert dropped his album. Yeah. Um, I think it was Love is Rage 2. Yeah, um, man. And I think, a, couple of dope, a couple of the homies on that project, man. I, I saw that Illmind was on there. He did one, uh, like, uh, something Miami. Record, okay. That was pretty, pretty dope on the project. Yeah, I got, yeah I got, pretty Miami, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Probably not pretty mommy, I'm sorry. Pretty, pretty mommy? mommy yeah. I'm sorry, man. I said Miami. God, <laughs> yeah. I'm tripping. Pretty yeah. mommy. Pharrell was on there. Wonder Girl is on there. Don Cannon is on there yeah, as yeah. well. That's dope, man. I mean, it, it was cool, man. I listened to it, man. Um, I'm I'm still, it's still my, you know, it's still out there for me. I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, That came out. Um, uh, If I hope I say his name right, XXX Tension. Yeah. XX. I actually yeah. enjoyed his project. I, I, I got a chance to listen to maybe four or five of the records just going right in. Okay. Um, it's cool, man. Like, one thing that's kind of different about him is it's kind of like he kind of got like an acoustic slash trap vibe. It's, it's something yeah. 
it's something different. Definitely something different. And um, it's cool. To, it's cool to check out, man. Yeah. Like I was really into some of the stuff that was going on. Um, again, you know, I'm, I need a day or two more to sit with those, but. Yeah, he they, produced a lot of that, about, I think, half of it himself. And oh, that's even doper. Potsu produced on there, and uh, Natural Average, and uh, Nick Mira, and Taz Taylor. And then, okay. of course, Detail. Detail was finding as well in everything. Yeah. Uh, he did a song on there as well, so shout out to him. Um, uh, Brock Hampton um, album, you know, that's a very, very, uh, um, I guess, uh, underground out, uh, band. Uh, uh, they do like kind of like hip hop, kind of like um, alternative. I mean, it's really interesting. But that was a pretty good album, though, man. Right. Um, um, Saturation too, and uh, I think uh, Ramil Hamani did a lot of a lot of uh, production on there. I think most of the production he did on there as well. So that was a good album. And then I got put up on this new guy, Daniel Caesar. Right. That I think a lot of people are talking about. A lot of the tastemakers are talking about. It's an R and B joint um, called. Um, Daniel's called uh, Freudian, I believe. Yeah. Very, very good album. He's a singer out of Toronto, an right. R&B singer. Very, very good project. Probably my favorite project of the weekend. You know what I'm saying? It was really, 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 really good, man. So I would uh, get them props. You know, that's a pretty good album. So check out those projects and, and uh, let us know, you know, what you think. Let us know, you know, if you think it's dope. I'm, I'm just over here tripping and laughing, man, because, like, this is our first time going on tape, man, and we yeah. got, like, my... My artist Sky is over here just like having her own party in the other room. So, oh, okay. y'all, please forgive us for that. You know what I'm saying? She need to come on camera this Yeah, one. you might as well come <laughs> say what's up to everybody. That's what the play is. Like, we got two cameras. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, yeah. You never know man. what's going to happen never here. Know, the free man. game. Yeah, that's podcast, what it is. Man. You know well, what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I mean, it's good stuff going on, man. You know, as we were saying, though, you know, um, one of the things we're trying to do here at the Free Game Podcast, man, is just kind of step it up. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We've been talking for months about, uh, you know, just kind of getting our content game up, man. And, and so we decided to take this and go into a visual place. Um, you know, uh, right now this is all test stuff. We're going to see how it goes, man. But uh, I'm, I'm super excited about what we got in front of us, man. You know, it's, it's a Most little... Definitely. You know, you're nervous, man. You're nervous to be on camera right now, bro. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you're nervous to be on camera. <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> nervous to be on camera. Come on, man. No, Get man. with it. <laughs> no, man. Not but yeah. Maybe if it was live, I might be a little nervous if it was live. Man. You didn't know we was live, man? Whatever, We're man. live right now, man. We're going to the whole world. We live? Ray J voice. But yeah. no. Nah. Run it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, good music coming out. A couple of things I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, MTV Video Music Awards dropped uh, last night. And, uh, you know, the video element seems to kind of, like, be missing in terms of the budgeting, in terms of, like, really focus. People just think, of course, visuals are important because, you, you know, we have Instagram, YouTube, and all that. But it seems like people aren't really putting the um, money behind a lot of, uh, at yeah. least on the independent independent side. Yeah, well, I'm, you know what? I won't say it's so much the money as much as it is. The quality of the, the actual kind of what I meant, yeah. Quality. Yeah, because like you know, of course the, the money is gonna be less these days because the uh, technology is much better. You know what I'm saying? Like honestly, bro, right now your phone man shoots a higher quality than some of the high quality cameras used to shoot back in the day. So honestly, like the technology is there. So that's kind of why the prices have dropped on things. It's like kind of crazy, but I man, it's people. Somebody do your video for three hundred dollars. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I you mean, know. you know, to me that's just the. To me, I yeah, I don't, I don't, you know how I am about people like uh, gouging and and ungouging. I guess the word would be in these type of situations. But I made that word up, by the way. But um, well, gouging is a word. I think you, you used it in a unique I used way. It in a, yeah. I used it in the in the, in the opposite <laughs> right. uh, text that I should have. <laughs> However, I just kind of feel like you know. Um, I think what you were trying to get at maybe is, uh, you know, that just people aren't as um, creative and they're not being as uh, careful about what they're producing and what they're coming up with. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just because you have a camera doesn't mean you can shoot it or you should yeah. shoot it. You know, sometimes you have to be mindful of the content that you're putting together. You know, I mean, we feel the same way about even the music, though, man. Like with production, like we're big, we're big on people being, uh, you know, present and what it is they're trying to approach you know yeah. like you can't just do shit because it's available to do 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the guy that's always like, nah, I don't just want somebody who can do something. I want somebody who's actually a professional at it. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and it's good, and it's going to produce a product that's going to put right. me. I need that person to care about it as much as I would. You know yeah. what I mean? So well, that's the problem. I think a lot of people don't really care. They think they can just shoot anything. They can just get up and rap, yeah. rap at the on the corner. And sometimes, you know, if done properly, those kind of raw videos will be dope. But most of the time, it's just, well, yeah, just, just standing around, man, sitting on the porch, man. And yeah. it's just like, dog, come on, man. You know what I'm saying? No creativity. No, they paid the homie $300. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, And, nah, and I, now I, they want to blow up. Right. And sometimes, you know, I think maybe, maybe the problem a, a Chief Keith messed the game exactly. up. Exactly. The problem that. is somebody went out and got it done for $300 and... And it went down. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all relative. You might be out there at home with nothing, and you just try and make it try. And Absolutely. God bless you. You know what I'm saying? But I think that sometimes if you really want to put the thought into it, and, 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 and if you're able to kind of like. So what, so what, like, what sparked this in you? Like, what, what did you see at the video awards that made you uh, interested in? Talking like about the, Yeah, like the quality of the work. Was it? Because, well, I mean, I, I heard you say earlier in just our own conversation that, um. Like Kendrick won like something four big. or five awards. He he won like a lot of awards. Right, and I think my video. comment on that was it was a dope video for today, but like in the nineties, that video would have been like another, an average another. video, not right. even like a super dope video. Because everyone, everyone at the labels are really putting like you're talking about half a million, one million dollar budgets for a video, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure what this video budget is, but it's it's well over six figures. Well, you think it has to be. Maybe we I don't can look know, at man. It. I mean, I, I don't know. I, this, I know this video with, is definitely a six-figure video. Now, would Easy. I know that with like graphics and all of the kind of probably stuff that, multiple six-figure videos. I don't know. I wonder if we could find that out. I got a whole bunch of film people in the building. Let's today, put a wager man. on like, that. Y'all think that video that he shot was a uh, uh, high price, or y'all feel like it? It, it was. Y'all think it was a six-figure video though? The uh, Kendrick Lamar humble. Ken, the humble video. Techno crank? Oh, sorry, see, you talking about some shit I don't know about, so. Okay, all right. Well, so, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about in that field, so. Me either. I'm just saying, like. I got, I got, I'm, I'm just thinking like an executive. It's got to be six figures for that video. No, nah, well, I mean, obviously. Like, and then the guy. Who no they, matter what, we are clear, though, that they spent some money on their video as opposed to a lot of what we see you, you know what i'm saying like yeah cause sometimes some a lot of my favorite records of the past f four or five years you know you hope and pray to do a video for it then you see the video and you're like really mm -hmm. like that's what y'all want to come yeah, up yeah, with yeah, for yeah, this for this song you know so um well, I, I just think that's, that's i just think it's creative man because like i said technology is allowing that, that's a people, good point because yeah. you could do dope shit, man with less expensive stuff if you have the right creative people doing it like it's just kind of like you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like i've seen some of the most plain images be so on point you know what i'm saying I, yeah i guess it, it kind of depends on the song and the mood you know a lot of the different factors wait, i'm gonna but. tell you man one of my favorite videos of all time man was uh it's an old video alanis morissette okay I can't remember the song, man, but in this video, they were and she was in a car, and she was playing four different roles in the car. Okay. So like the driver was one person, and then her passenger was another person, and the two back people in the back seat were all different people, and she played all four parts in the video. Nice, nice. But it was a ba it wasn't a very hard to shoot video. It wasn't like super crazy, but like you can tell creatively, it was just an amazing piece. But anyway, man, that's a whole nother show. We'll get into that some other day. Yeah, I'm trying to get my computer to work right. It's kind of freezing, but I had the whole list of winners. I know Kendrick Lamar won, I think, Best Rap Video. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one of the uh, cinematography videos. I tell you what did win, though. Kanye West uh, video with Tiana Taylor dancing. That won Best, that shit should have won. best Choreography. I, that's, that's a, that video was dope to me, man. Yeah. So much that like the song wasn't even jamming to me, but the video was crazy. Did it make you like the song more? Don't don't like her. She's right. she was beating the, well, that, beating like, the ground. And I think that that was necessary. I think that that's what honestly. That's I what think videos are for. That's what videos are for. Like yeah, like in a sense, a video is supposed to make you understand what they want you to feel about the song. Yeah. And like Kanye is a is a genius at that because almost all of his videos kind of tell you how you're supposed to react to it. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Because if you didn't have the videos, 
some of his records come on man you wouldn't get it you would be like what because so many people were not with the yeezus album they thought it was just so left but it wasn't until we started seeing some visuals and we were like, oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Even at, our, even at that one video, where he was kind of like, yeah, that was a good one. Come on, man. Well, you like Jesus, though. I didn't. <laughs> I so love Jesus, that's, by that's the way. The, y'all, don't, y'all don't understand. That's the, that's the, is, that's the debate. But no, um, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to get the winners, man, on here. Just. Computer acting up, but well, uh, I, let's not even worry about that. Let's talk about this fight, man. <laughs> oh, okay, because you, uh, you know what I'm saying. Let's talk about that then. Let's, let's get to the fight, man, and then get to this beat break because we got a lot of stuff to talk we about do. on this. We um, do, we do. This pay the producer, we do. Yeah, the fight, uh, you know, it's not really music related, even though, let's see, um, I mean, but you can't be a part of American culture yeah. right now at well, he all. Did come out. He, he came out, to, he came it's out like with right his, now, with three his, like two things are like you have to talk about in American culture. One is our president, and the well, other we one, talked about and, that. and we've <laughs> talked about that, and the other one is the McGregor and yeah. Mayweather fight. Well, it is what I it saw is. the fight. I put up the hundred bucks to to watch it. Yeah, um, I thought it was a, a good fight, Com- especially when you compare it to Floyd's, let's say five last five or six fights, where I think against Maidana. A couple times it was a little competitive, but other than that, Floyd is a master of not getting hit. He dances around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't really do a lot of knows, offense. Yeah, he knows how to fight. He's a great but defensive fighter. I think he had to because I think he lost the first three or four rounds of this fight. So he kind of, you know, yeah, had to be aggressive to win the, the later rounds. Right. And McGregor got tired. You could tell he was winded. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's whatever. I, I I think the result is what everybody thought it would be. Right. I did. I will say this. The one thing that I thought was really, really dope about the whole thing was the sportsman-like conduct yeah. in the end. You yeah. know, I thought that they were both very classy. Absolutely. And even though I walked away knowing in my heart that this was just a money grab and it, it, was, was, it was a play for the bread, it was. I still felt like I got my money's worth for that. That's what I felt, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, you know, it's like anything else in entertainment. Like, you spend your money knowing that the whole point was yeah. to get you to spend the money. Yeah. But once you spent it, it's like okay, cool, yeah. Like to me, that was a good, a and good McGregor, move. A good move. I, I good think moment. he hit Floyd more than I thought he was gonna hit Floyd. You know. Yeah, but I give McGregor props, man. But, like, but I, I don't man. think Floyd took this fight as serious in terms of training. And he's older. I, he's he's probably years didn't old. need to. He knew what was up. It's kind of yeah. like, I mean, we are talking about a you know, a champion that's never lost. Right. right. You just don't. You just don't really walk in and beat somebody like that. Right. Now, had he. You know what I'm saying? I think I tweeted out or somewhere. I said this would have been the biggest upset in sports history, sports in my history, opinion, bro, yeah. if he had a one. Yeah, that's and, why. And he was looking good early, but again, I think Floyd was just hey, kind of letting you, him. Like we talked about early, though, it was that bot, that one body shot, bro. Almost beginning ended around, the fight, yeah, boy. beginning around nine. I don't know if y'all remember. Which, ironically, that is the round when Floyd started to beat the shit out of. Him yeah, later I think on. he might have pissed him off. <laughs> right. Like, oh, so, oh, I, but, I, but he tagged. He probably him. was like, man, that, this ain't what we talked about before the fight, man. <laughs> right. Now I got the wax. <laughs> he tagged him pretty hard. I was gonna give you twelve rounds, bro, but you're going down now, nigga. I think he. <laughs> heard him. I think he tagged him and hurt him again. But yeah, it was a good fight, man. And you know, it was good for the for culture. God bless everybody. It made their money. I think Connor's making a r- more money he ever made on on the fight. So nah, that's dope. Well, so, so yeah. listen, man. What we got going on this week? Um, it's the it's the second episode of our six week pay the producer mm-hmm. series. Yep, yep. Um, we're gonna get into talking this week about um, uh, payments in terms of uh, royalties, mechanical okay. royalties. Uh, uh, record royalties and uh, performance royalties. Yeah, and we got you know stick around because we got a very special guest on the show, man. We got Charles Hester speaking with us, uh, aka Chalo. Mm-hmm. Chalo is the producer that wrote the beat for Millie. Yeah, he's credited but as a he's writer. Credited as a writer, but oh my god, when y'all hear this story, y'all gonna be like, whoa. Yeah. Um. So stick around, man. We're gonna talk about that, and uh, you know what I'm saying. We're gonna take a little beat break right quick. Uh, welcome to the show. Yes, sir. Free Game Producer Podcast. Be back in a minute. Yeah.
Welcome back to the podcast. You know what I'm saying? We are on our pay to producer series. This is the second part where we're talking about um, producers and producers getting paid properly and getting their proper credit. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, we started last week talking about with, with the homeboy Smitty about what to do. What are your first steps? You know, how to copyright your music, right. how to figure out what your upfront fee should be if you're brand new. Right. You know what I'm saying? And we can get into a little bit more of that as we, as we go along. But uh, understand that, uh, you know, when music is released commercially, they're like payments. You know, that should be you're entitled to. Mm-hmm. Now, these payments may or may not be gotten from upfront fees however regardless you need to know as your music lives and as it travels where the money's coming from right and where it should come from right right so in recorded music there's a thing called royalties mm-hmm. there's several types of royalties that we want to cover and, and we have some real life situations too to kind of you know highlight which we'll get into with our guests later on mm-hmm. but anytime music is released commercially there are certain uh royalties that should be uh given to producers right now um, you may hear different names for like the types of royalties. You got mechanical royalties, you got performance royalties, and all of that stuff. Um, and understand that, like, as a producer, you're entitled to some of these royalties. Yeah, you definitely are. Like, I think any time a person writes a song or is a part of it, right? Um, that you're you're entitled to a certain amount of royalties. Right. Now that percentage changes Absolutely. based off of. Absolutely. You know, negotiations and however many songs or on albums or just whatever the play may be. Right. But uh, like a lot of people just don't realize that like you're never in a situation if a song comes out and it's earning money, um, you're definitely entitled to that. So there's a way you can collect on anybody. Like For the most part, and we're going gonna to hear a little bit later how there's a couple little things that may prevent you. Yeah, to, I mean, the, really, the the only thing that I know of that will completely prevent you from it would be just not uh, having your paperwork, paperwork together yeah. to uh, establish your songwriter's percentages of the records, or yeah, or you know, like, if, and we're gonna find out today if if you, if you sample something as a uh, producer, at that point, if you don't get it cleared, the person who you sample will have yeah. some of your leverage at, at that point. Yeah, but but I mean, even in the like. Even at that point, you know what I'm saying? I don't think that there, the, what I'm saying, I'm not trying to say it represents any one particular person. Gotcha. My point would be gotcha. if you sample something, then the writer of that sample is still going to be able to collect on those royalties. And then it's up right. to them if they feel like you manipulated the sample enough to be considered a writer and receive royalties as well. Right. But my point, my point overall is just, um, you know, you're, somebody's entitled Anytime there's a song being written The writers of that record are entitled to uh, royalties mm-hmm. Or the owner of those copyrights or whatever Are entitled to that So right. Now I want to back up a little bit off the mechanicals Because you know mechanicals we're talking about people who Who write the words And write the music to, to records But even before that you know you have Let's say a recording artist who Didn't write their song mm-hmm. but they're the artist mm-hmm. You know and per their contract They'll get certain points uh, off of the record mm-hmm. uh, Producers In many cases Are giving points Off off the record as well And depending on The logistics And the contract Sometimes A lot of times Those points come out Of the artist portion mm-hmm. But as a producer You are entitled If you can Work out a deal To get points On the record mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying mm-hmm. as, For the actual sales Whether or not You actually um, Well As a producer you Hopefully you wrote The music yourself Hopefully mm-hmm. But either way You should, should get points off a record. Yeah, well, that's the those those are the negotiable things. I think, man. I think uh, a lot of times point negotiation comes from the amount of um, work that you've done on an album. Okay. Um, normally, points and, in my opinion, points and actual mechanical royalties are two different things. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Okay. Even, cool. even before you get into the mechanicals, as a producer, you know, depending on. In your negotiations What you did You can get points Off a of record Yeah 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 So like yeah Points are normally uh, More on the Overall sale Of the project So right. and, So in that case After the royalties And stuff are calculated And there's still More money into it Like let's say a, An album is $10 uh-huh. You know what I'm saying And the royalty rate On the album Is like 6 6 percent or whatever it mm-hmm. is well anything over that six percent is still money that has to be divvied up right and that's where they come up with things like point structures and mm-hmm. they come up with you know other things that go apart right. with that so um 
but that, that's the, but I just think that you know knowing that there's a such thing called a point structure is really good for producers because absolutely in a lot of cases um some people play different roles like like you you know we always talk about who's actually writing and producing the music well right. some people aren't that person some people are the person who might say well you know what I paid for this to happen so they want X amount of points on the album to become like the executive producer in the situation because yeah. Um, that's how that works, and most executive producers are paid in a point scale. On yeah. a point scale, uh, we'll get into the points later because I, okay. I would, I really would like to dig into what that really means and and what that can actually equate to financially. Absolutely, um, because um, executive production, man, is a really big deal. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It, yeah. it does a number of things for you. It allows you to live with a project for the life of it. And it also allows you to get bigger jobs and it moves you up into the rankings as far as right. um, like, uh, like uh, you know, when records are being done. Yeah, I mean, but it's something just to kind of be aware of, you know what I mean? And you're right, it is, you know, it seems like rookie producers, points is not even like something that comes into play. Let's say you get a placement on a major album, mm -hmm. you know, one or two songs. Points may not necessarily even be in the equation because of your leverage, et cetera, right. et cetera. However, just know that that's one revenue stream for mm -hmm. producers aside from even your mechanical royalties. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, points, because as we're going to see with our guest today, you know what I'm saying? Like our guest today, I don't want to steal the thunder but of, of the interview, but, you know, because of certain uh, copyrights and samples, the mechanicals wasn't there. But I'm thinking like, well, you helped produce the song, so maybe if... The, producer got points and you co-produced it maybe you should have got some of those points something somewhere mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so just kind of be aware of that but also um that is true you know yeah. those are that's one stream but then you get got mechanical royalties and we can kind of get into that now yeah. yeah well mechanical royalties man are basically the royalties that come from um the sale of actual uh physical cds um you know they basically come off the, of the actual sale of the product yeah and, and the thinking is that you're paying the copyright holder to record and put out their music mm -hmm. you're paying for that so yeah. the person who wrote it the record label is paying for the right to put out your to, re to record right. and put out your um copyright right and so also you got to understand that it's not just um you know it's just not cds and vinyl anymore it's also mm -hmm. streaming mm -hmm. uh, it's on demand mm -hmm. you know so that can, that's for spotify that's all of those types of things yeah and so you know um basically anything that that people are presenting your music to the public with uh -huh. in in some type of tangible form or nowadays digital form um that's where you get paid your mechanical royalties right and so um nowadays it's really interesting it's, it's it's a crazy conversation to have because you know like we said we talked about earlier that you know you would get uh you would get a producer rate for um uh, for an agreed rate on a certain amount of records on the album mm -hmm. back in the day and mm -hmm. now man you know everything is playlist bound so honestly it's almost like putting out 12 singles yeah you know there's hardly any hard copies anywhere it's hardly anything like that going on so yeah. i think the game is going to change in that sense i think that mm -hmm. those are some of the things that they're trying to talk to congress about and figuring out exactly how to pay producers properly in those types of environments yeah. you know um but then there's um and to, re to reiterate as far as the, the uh, mechanical royalties, you know, um, as a producer, um, you are responsible for the music, and it, and a song is half music, half lyrics. So if you compose, we're gonna find out later about the word composition. You know, mm. key word to use. If you compose the music, you know, you should be responsible for fifty percent of those um, mechanical royalties. So right. you know, and right. also kind of before we before we jump ahead mechanical royalties in a lot of cases are collected either by yourself from the label or if i'm not wrong a publisher collects yeah, yeah, your mechanical yeah. royalties for you well yeah um well with record labels um there's companies like harry fox agency and people like that they actually go out and collect for the labels and things like that now um performance royalties is another thing though right that's, that's where the, something else yeah so yeah, yeah so i wanted with, to make sure i was trying to exhaust this before we jumped on oh to, yeah to, that's to, cool well oh uh, yeah to, so to performance royalties, yeah, yeah, but, yeah so yeah you're so, right so, about so that though having a publisher because i guess the question often becomes okay who pays these royalties and how do i go about getting finding out if i'm a producer and i put put a song out or i had got a placement 
how do I follow up with that to make right. sure my money is is, is yeah, properly? Yeah, I think it would be to hire an me. agency for something like that. I, I mean, I just know Harry Fox Agency is like the largest, or They're, at one point was the only one. I'm I'm not really sure. It, but they were the only one, but it's kind of it's a couple of I forget the names. A couple of smaller ones. That yeah, are, that are more, kind of more now. I'm sure there are many of them at this point, but. Yeah, that's the way it would work is a label would actually be responsible for paying the royalties. It's in the contracts. What they basically do is agree to a certain amount of mechanical royalties to be paid out. Mm -hmm. And um, where it gets really confusing, let me tell you when it gets weird. It's, it's A lot of times it gets weird when records go over a certain amount of songs. Because what they don't realize is mechanical royalties only have to be paid out for X amount of records. So let's say the number is 12. So if it's 13 songs on there, that 13 song is not, you're not guaranteed to get a ro uh, mechanical royalty for that 13 song. And I can imagine it's so tricky if you only got one or two placements on there. And maybe if your song falls somewhere on the playlist where it's outside of that. Right. Anytime. I, al I already don't expect a very high return on an album that has anything more than 12 to 15 songs on it. At that point, I know that it's best for me to try to collect on the front end of the record because the back end of it may never happen. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing they're going to do is they're going to pick the 12 songs that perform probably the best. And that's what they're going to pay from. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So in a case like that, what I don't like to do is I don't like to put myself in a position as a producer who's counting on my royalties to pay bills. You know what I'm saying? So I would say, like, if I know for a fact that it's a double album and I know it's 20 songs involved here. I'm going to go ahead and try to get as much of my royalties up front. And that way I don't have to stress over that that idea. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? So, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I approach that. Yep. Uh, louder and Easy Song Licensing are a couple of the other uh, competitors to the Harry Fox Agency. And the reason why this is important to know also, if you're independent, because the, the labels deal with, with Harry Fox, the publishers do, but a lot of these independent artists have no idea where to begin. Right, exactly. Like, and that's what I was saying earlier. Like, take for instance, um, let's say you do a project or a song or, or just a song, period, for someone who's, let's say, independent and they're actually selling records and this, that, and the third, but, you know, like most independent labels out here, they're operating not really in a super business fashion. Yeah. And they don't have like a, a collecting, you know, they're not really doing the proper collection of money or yeah. distribution of monies. Mm -hmm. You definitely need to reach out to like a Harry Fox agency or somebody and hire them to come in and actually do the uh, due diligence yeah, for, because you know, on your behalf because you don't know where to start, you know, and like calling to look into books or calling to look into accounting and things of that nature. Like you just don't know. Right. You know what I'm saying? And. Because, again, to kind of put these pieces pieces of the pie together for you all, we talked about producer declarations a few weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. Those things specify that the label owns the master, mm -hmm. or the master recording. So the, the money is going to go to the label, whoever owns the master recording. Right. It's your job to make sure that they pay out, pay, pay out right. per the, the agreements yeah, that absolutely. were written out. So. Yeah. You know, that's what, why we see a lot of lawsuits. When a record gets big, mm -hmm. somebody's suing somebody because maybe they got paid up front their little fee or in advance. Right. But based on the numbers, they, they some some attorney figured out you're owed a couple hundred thousand dollars right. or, or whatever it is. Right, so, right, right. And depending on your contract, you know, a lot of times, man, these royalties don't get paid out until recoupment of the entire project is taking place yeah so sometimes you're sitting around waiting on a royalty and they still trying to, and you can't get it because the videos haven't been paid for or something that kind of didn't have anything to do with the actual making of the song yeah. so it gets weird sometimes which is why it's really important to have an attorney who knows how to uh set your dates for when um your clauses and stuff kick in right because like you can have your clauses set from record one you can have your set, your clauses set from uh once everything is recouped it is really a bunch of tricky stuff that takes place and and you know yeah uh, it could really affect the way you get paid or even if you get paid you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah and something else to note even again with our interview today you'll see a lot of these things 
you want to take your time on and get it spelled out before you sign. Mm -hmm. Don't be so hungry necessarily to get get yeah. to get on. And it's a balance because you don't want to be somebody that's a problem when you first getting started either. But you know, you want to make sure a lot of this yeah, stuff but is spelled I mean, out. And, and you know what? I'm a hundred percent for like trying to play the game. I, I'm with that. But man, mm -hmm. uh, you know, today we speak to someone who admits openly man that those mistakes ruined his life ruined his his life musically um you know i mean he's fine he's okay it's yeah. not like i'm you know trying to you know say anything bad about the person in general but um i just think that it's important that people understand that you know had he maybe been a little um more forthright in what he wanted or you know or even nuke when we find out in the, in our interview you know what I'm saying? That he he just didn't know. It wasn't that he couldn't. Right. So in those types of situations, though, man, you know, like we're talking about a completely life changing instance. Yeah, absolutely. Which is just incredible. And, mm -hmm. and this next story is super awesome in telling us that. Yeah. Um, what so, were we going to next? The performance project? Yeah, I guess so. So I'm, you know, again, any type of uh, questions y'all have, hit us up. You know what I'm saying on our page, but that that's pretty much mechanical royalties in a nutshell, and we may kind of revisit as we yeah, go like, as like, we go along. Yeah, like I'm I'm pretty sure you guys are understanding that right now we're just kind of touching the surface of these things, but mm -hmm. like in the comments and stuff, man, you know, ask the questions, like give us some more details as to what mm -hmm. it is you want to know. We're here to answer those questions, mm -hmm. and if we don't know the answer to it, we're certainly gonna look into it and uh, you know be able to give you like exactly what you need as far as uh you know that information mm -hmm. um but we can go right in the performance performance royalties. Royalties. yeah basically man anywhere that your music is playing like if it's on the radio if it's in a restaurant if it's on a bar you're in the elevator spotify all of those types of things man those are called like pu public performance type of situations so mm -hmm. uh, which is crazy because um it says that streaming services are also on the mechanical side so how is Spotify kind of on the performance side as well? It's a very interesting. Maybe because Spotify has like a radio section to it as well. Um, but we can get into that because I really don't know. So I don't want to get to saying things that I'm not really yeah, clear about. And I think our homeboy uh, Greg from CSAC touched on this a little bit. Yeah. But even I mean, then, you know, though. Cause all of them, because like Pandora is a radio station. It's not really a streaming station. It is, but it's also a radio station. So I think when they double as... It's it's really the, the strange. lines are blurred. They, they're the lines very are blurred. blurred. Yeah. yeah, because the, the you have stations on all the streaming networks, I, right? Exactly, I believe, where they yeah. kind of just play whatever they want based on what you what you like. So at any rate, I think the bottom line of this is you know what I'm saying. That's another way for you to get paid, and the way that the people that collect those are performance rights organizations, which mm -hmm. that would be like your BMIs and your ASCAPs. And your C sex and all of those types of things, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. Sound exchange and things like that. Those types of people are taking care of the digital realm of collecting royalties. So, what about uh, um, concerts? Concerts are mechanicals. No, I'm tripping. Concerts are. Perform, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm perform, sorry. Yeah, the yeah. performance royalties. I'm tripping. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because don't venues are supposed to turn in their playlists. Yeah, exactly. And, like and, and pay accordingly. Right, they're supposed to pay accordingly. Like they pay a blanket rate basically, and yeah. out of that blanket rate is what they're supposed to pay out yeah. if your song was on the playlist during one of those. And, and that's why I want to kind of take a second to highlight the fact because we had a, a, a kid on. We're not on the show. We talked to a kid. We might play a, a parts of his, our conversation, but basically, when you even with mixtapes, when you give people beats and they perform them. Revenue is generated, yes, but also your publishing, your um, your performance rights organization can collect money for, for yeah, you. Yeah, you're supposed to be able to, you right? You know what I'm saying? And so, so, and then, of course, you got set list issues and all that murky stuff. Right. But Which is why it's really important, no matter what, when you're doing records, you're supposed to register them with your PRO. So absolutely. once they're registered, then you'll be able to collect. Absolutely. Yeah. Register with your PROs and make sure you stay on top of stuff. No matter what the scenario is. You know, last week we talked about where to begin once you finish producing the record now you got to follow that record i don't care if it's a mixtape i don't care what it is make sure it's registered because there's going to be revenues from either one of these royalties uh, right, right, whether right. with performance royalties you know recorded royalties right, right. mechanical royalties 
there's money that you're owed, so you have to kind of be on top of uh, right. what happens to your music. So yeah, anytime it's performed, and we didn't even get into licensing yet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, licensing. Right. We might cover that next week, but yeah, your song lives, so you got to know where it's going and keep track of what revenue is generated. Right. Don't be so hungry to get in the game that you sign over your rights or just you skip over stuff. Because right. even what our producer today on the on the, on the show um, that we interview. He just kind of skipped over some stuff. Right. Skipped you know, a lot of stuff, actually. So. That, that, that came back to bite him in the end. So right. that's what I would say. Right. You know what I'm saying? Be on top of that. Well, for let's real, get into that, man. Let's jump into that. Jump into that. Okay. Uh, another that, beat break? Yep. Yeah, let's beat. do another beat break, man. Cool. We come back. We got uh, Chalo, uh, Chuck Hester, yeah. a.k.a. Chalo, the producer. Yes, uh, sir. The record, Millie. Shy town Shy in the house. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Holla. Peace. Welcome back to the Free Game Producer Podcast. My name is Brian Andre, and I got Will Power on the line. We've also got a very, very, very special guest today. We've been talking about, uh, you know, pay the producer, mm -hmm. producer appreciation. And we got a producer on the line from Chicago, I believe, uh, originally. Uh, done some great things, worked with a lot of people. He's multi-platinum. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, super dope, super dope. <laughs> you know, responsible for 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 records such as a Millie, uh, Drop. Yeah, you know, a lot of dope records. We've got uh, Charles Hester, aka Chalo, on the line. Yeah. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How about yourself? Great, great, great. Yeah, it's a blessing man. to be here. Chalo, we got you yeah, on the man. line, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gravy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So you're from Chicago yeah. originally? Did I, did yeah, I'm I get from that right? Chicago. And uh, from the south okay. side, 79th Street. Uh, I don't know. A lot of people talk about the whole Chance the Rapper right. thing. He's from 79th as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. south side, no suburb. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's one of my favorite cities, Chicago. I'm there a lot, probably every month. And um, we've had other producers from Chicago on the line, and mm -hmm. I always ask about. You know, certain cities have certain sounds to them. To me, and certain times you can kind of just hear a certain city's influence. So. Uh, do you, what what is it about the Chicago sound um, that's uh, unique from your perspective? Yeah, so I I come from a, a so I, I come from house music. So um, my sister used to go to uh, this club called the Warehouse when I was a kid, you know, basically a child, and she used to bring this um, this music home. And it was a guy named Frankie Knuckles, a number of other DJs. It would be this this. Hole in the wall place uh, on Michigan or like on Jefferson or something down there. But um, she would bring these tapes home or this music home. And I was like, man, it was kind of like disco, but it, it wasn't disco. It was like loop disco and sped up. And um, okay, I had never, you know, heard it. And uh, so she kept bringing the stuff home and then we would have these parties and um, people would come over into our basement, you know, and just start, you know, just dancing and all this other stuff. Well, basically, it turns out that this music eventually became what we know as house music today. And house music evolved into EDM. So what drives the world today sonically as far as the fourth to the floor is originally from Chicago. That Detroit turned it into techno, but all of that stuff... Um, Yep. Started from here, so like I said before, before they just took the wear off the house, you know, word. So instead of calling it warehouse music, it uh, just is called house music now. And um, yeah, so that's basically, nice. you know, uh, where I come from. And um, now when it comes to um, that part of it, you know, you just have so many different avenues. Um, that you're able to use um, to get your message across, whether it's chord progressions or it's voices or just odd sounds, you know. And a lot of times, um, the, the less you use, uh, the more impactful um, the presence of the, the, the 
sound that you're trying to get across or the the um, the emotion that you're trying to evoke because it, it doesn't take a lot, you know. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Like like in that last few sentences, man, like you completely summed out summed up the type of producer that you are and the sound that you you've come up with. Um, you know, a lot of our listeners don't know uh, that you are the producer of the uh, the uh, Millie Beak, or you participated in it in some sort. I know for a fact that you did that beat <laughs> because um, you know uh, my our backstory. Uh, B, um, you know, I, I met Charlo uh, here in Atlanta. You know, he was producing here in Atlanta for a few years, and um, he was just incredible man like this like he said he would find these odd sounds and he'd, he'd make these odd loops that just sounded like what the you know what you know mm. what i'm saying so and so i would go and we would we would sit around and uh you know we would listen to music and just kind of play beats for each other man and i would hear stuff and i actually heard the millie beat like a good year maybe before it even was the millie beat you mm. know what i'm saying and so um, we'll get into that in a second, but I just wanted to point out that it's really unique to me that um, even the production style that you ended up um, mastering and having so many other people like really jack from you was created from your experience in house music and how it just kind of it cultivated the producer that you became. I think that's really interesting. And I, I think I, I think our listeners need to hear that, you know, it's OK to listen to music that isn't quite what people call the uh, mainstream stuff it's almost like you almost want to be looking in the odd places to find something to help make you become really unique and different yeah, you know? yeah. I, it's interesting Absolutely. because um you know with that during that time a lot of the djs would um put like vocal samples or just a vocal on top of um, the beat, and they would just let it ride straight through, and uh, it it would become hypnotic at some point. And um, you know, I grew up with that. So you had you know, Farley, I think Jack My Body, and all this other stuff. Just so many different records that they employed this um, this uh, approach to. And so you know, when I was in Atlanta, or when I got there rather, and I was like, man, you know. I, I want to come up with something different. So for me, you know, being in Atlanta, very honestly, taught me more so about uh, the trap sound because during that time, trap was really just starting to take, the sound of trap really just started to take shape. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was um, able to yeah. uh -huh. you know, say, okay, well, let me figure out how I can, you know, do what I'm doing differently. And... Um, I decided instead of using vocal, I mean, uh, chord progressions or, you know, guitars or whatever the case is, I, I chose voices, you know, and so, but it, it, you're definitely right about um, it coming from uh, my house background, but there was, it was specifically, you know, listening to those records that had the vocal track um, that would be looped and repeated and, you know, basically just, you know, programmed. Uh, to um, be a, uh, a center point and the driving melody for the track itself throughout the course of the song. Right, right. Nice, nice. So, uh, not to kind of go back too far, but again, coming from Chicago, how did you actually uh, start producing? Like, you know, coming from that house background, oh, you know, when did you first start <laughs> making beats? Did you, you know, what, what equipment did you kind of start? Uh, well, <laughs> sorry, usually. It's always good, good well, to find out. I can definitely say yeah. it wasn't Fruity Loops. <laughs> yeah, like, don't. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't start on Fruity Loops. <laughs> <laughs> see, <man. laughs> <laughs> and see that's, that's why we asked, because, yeah, you know, no, we want no, people to know. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding, man. And I'll, yeah, man. Shout out, shout yeah, out to well, the Fruity Loops. No, man, and it's, it's funny good. because I love Fruity Loops, <laughs> but it just didn't exist then. Yeah, <laughs> that was all. That's the only thing. Yeah, no doubt. But um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I use FL Studio now. So, but um, so so um, nice. basically, what happened when I was about um, thirteen, um, there really weren't uh, a whole lot of home studios or anything like that, but. You know, it was a, a group that I was 
in and basically I was the producer. It was three of us. And um, we wanted to go to the studio and um, we saved up our money. I was working for my father at the time. And uh, I think we saved up $35 a piece or whatever we saved up. And uh, we went in and, mm. you know, we created our first, uh, at that time, I guess you'd call it a demo. You know, we created our first record. And we made three of them or two of them. Mm. And uh, so we, we moved forward with that. But then, uh, as I continued to uh, mature, um, I ended up having a mentor uh, by the name of Dwayne Grant. And so my father had a store on 59th and State Street. And Dwayne lived like on 56 or something in Peoria or Prairie, something like that. But I could walk there. Now, if anybody knows anything about Chicago, they know about 59th and State Street in that whole area. It's not the safest place to be, especially you know, during that time, but it, it's still the same now. It, it's, it, it's rough, you know, and um, I used to have my uh, Casio keyboard with me and uh, my dad, would he wouldn't drop me off or anything like that, so I had to walk. So I'm walking probably a good, I don't know, six or seven blocks to get to the destination, but I'm going through neighborhoods, completely gang infested, completely, you know, just, just, it just is what it is. And I didn't want right. anybody to, you know, come at me. You know what I mean? So I used to um, wrap my uh, keyboard in a black plastic bag. And I would carry it kind of like I was, you know, just carrying garbage. And so that nobody, oh, wow. you know, uh, you know, would come at me because I'm not from that neighborhood. You know, so they don't they don't know me like that. I'm from 79th Street. And so I would, you know, begin my journey praying, you know, like, God, please let me get to get the grant. And um, that would, you know, be uh, on pretty much a daily basis. And, um, you know, God made sure that I got there safely with no hiccups. Uh, there were some moments, though, but... Um, you know, so I got there, mm -hmm. and uh, Dwayne played for a group uh, called Ten City. I don't know if you uh, remember um, Lupe Fiasco had a song. Uh, um, I forgot the record, man. And but basically, it's this group called Ten City that was huge at the time, and Dwayne was a you know he was okay. he played for them, and um, you know. Um, so he became my mentor. Uh, you know, I'm this kid just walking around, and you know, he basically helped me with uh, song structure. He uh, helped me understand uh, melody, you know, and all of these different things. And uh, it, he, one of the things, though he's a musician, he made sure to teach me that it wasn't about how cold of a musician you are or whatever. If it's hot, it's hot. If it ain't, it ain't. And I think a right. lot of times people make, well, musicians or whatever, they get caught up in the musicianship of stuff. And uh, I really never dealt with that. You know, I consider myself a producer, not a musician. You know what I mean? So um, that's one of the things that I was, you know, taught, um, you know, from him. And then uh, one of the biggest influences, though, that... Uh, even honestly more so than Quincy Jones I studied this guy by the name of uh, Little Lewis and I don't know if you guys know a song called French Kiss but you can look it up and this guy's um, it, 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 it comes from a house record background and uh, but he's like one of the he was listening to his music was you know one of the things that really taught me that you are able to replace um, all of this musicianship with just sound so I knew, listening to him, I only knew you only needed like five or six sounds or, you know, seven or eight at the most. So I didn't take all of that. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. studying him uh, was one of, honestly, he probably was my biggest influence um, coming up sonically. I ended up uh, after that, I, you know, I went away to school. <laughs> and so um, I ended up going to this place called Miles College. And... Um, 
during my time at Miles, I met this friend, one of my, he lived right next door to me, this guy by the name of William Phillips. And uh, he's just this dynamic singer, you know what I mean? And, you know, so I ended up, one of my girlfriends convinced me to join the choir. And so found out Will was in the choir. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, fine. I'm, I'm in there. And I remember this was my first time being, like, introduced to, um, like, gospel music. Um, I think prior to me going to Miles, uh, right. I had gone to church maybe five or six times, even though I went to a Catholic school. I remember sitting in the middle of all of these people, and um, we were in a classroom setting. And then the director just said, okay, one, two, three, boom. Then I just heard all of these harmonies. Everybody around me started singing. And it was just like, what the, what, what's going on? And I remember my, the hairs on my arm the moment right there. started raising up. So I started learning during that time what real singing was. You know what I mean? Uh, somebody to really sing from their soul. Somebody from Bessemer, Alabama that really doesn't have, you know, too much money or anything like that. You know, just belting. You know what I mean? Uh, just from something that I had never experienced coming from Chicago. Now, we're, we're a gospel town, but I, I really wasn't in that. But now where I'm somewhere in this one street pole with a light on it, you know, for the next mile or so, you know, and, uh, you know, with this conviction that I was listening to. And so we would go back to my house and, uh, you know, continue. So uh, fast forward years, it just turns out that my friend William ended up... Um, you know, being this guy, I don't know, a lot of people may not know him, but it's William Murphy, he's a gospel star right now. And, um, mm -hmm. but, yep. you know, it was just listening to um, the vocal conviction. And when I was in that process, and that also started to help me when it came to my production, because artists just couldn't come in and say, oh, I got a, I got a song or I can sing something. And it, I could completely and immediately identify if they weren't um, sincere or they weren't convicted by what was coming out of their mouth, whether they wrote it or not. You know, a lot of people are a bit more convicted because they lived it, but Patti LaBelle really didn't write too many of her own songs, but she lived them in the moment. So that, you know, being in that environment helped me, you know, understand... Um, you know that part of it. Um, no, that's that's a, that's a good extensive extensive breakdown on. Yeah. If, if people are l l reading between the lines, they're getting some game. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I think sure. it's important, man. That like you know, um, when 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 you get into the music production game, it's like so many things are going to inspire you. So many moments are going to be the reason why you, um, you know, those aha moments. I guess you would call them, where it's like, yeah. hey this is really what makes me feel good you know yep. what i'm saying this or is what this, i want to do this is what i want to do so right. yeah man nah we appreciate that um yeah let's let's go man so so here's the yeah. thing we, we we're, we're into this series called pay the producer and um like real quick just to give you like a, a a rundown of what it is man basically there's been a lot of stories coming out where of course producers are not being uh, credited properly they're also not being paid properly. Some not even being paid at all. Um, there's the whole thing nowadays where, like, you know, mixtapes and um, un, uh, you know, um, I guess unsolicited music, I guess that would be the word for it, you know, where music is free. You've got these new platform streaming and all this kind of different stuff. So we decided to do a six-week series on Pay the Producer, man. And um, I felt like, you know, you're with you being an extraordinary producer but also experiencing some crazy stuff in that form, we'd like to jump into that with you and, and let's talk a little bit about it. Um, Brian Brian has some stuff, so let's let's jump into that, man. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at different, like, strings, you know, ways producers get paid. And, you know, we have producer fees and you've got... Uh, you know, if you actually uh, write, you know, do the music, you, you're credited for for um, being a, a writer on the song with mm -hmm. the music. So you have uh, mechanical royalties and mm -hmm. publishing with that. And I was just looking into the Millie story, and I uh, see um, uh, you as credited, you know, as a writer on there, and it, and you're not credited as a producer. But when I do the research, you co-produce the record at least according to what yeah. I what I can see. So you know, and what people don't understand is that even uh, 
you know, being a writer of the music, you know, you're responsible for uh, getting royalty payments for mechanical royalty. So it can kind of get a little murky. So I just wanted to know a little bit about what your actual experience yeah. was, not you know, okay. what's on what's so, on the yeah. internet. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, this this business is uh, full of sharks, man. It's it's a uh, it's a lot of people that you know are out to get you. You know, and you really, you really have to mm-hmm. protect yourself from the sharks. But the most important thing that you have to do, and the first thing that you, person, you have to protect yourself from, is yourself. Why do I say that? Mm, that's a good one. You know, the Bible says that uh, my people, many people, perish from lack of knowledge. You know, and. Um, Mm-hmm. I was one of those people. Um, I made a lot of mistakes in this business, man. And, you know, with the Millie, it was pretty much my biggest one. And um, so with that being said, um, the whole of Millie, this is pretty much how it all happened. Uh, I made a beat uh, some years ago. And, um, you know, I, I kept it and I befriended, befriended a producer. And um, we became cool and, you know, all this other stuff. And he was like, well, man, send me some stuff, you know. Um, so I would send him, we would go back and forth, send him beats and stuff like that. But I can say, man, during that time period, I was I was careless about um, how I did things. I, I, You know, my wife would tell me, Chucky, you know, sample, I mean, uh, check your, your samples, or check, you know, this, or check all this other stuff. I'd be out, man, please. I wasn't trying to. Yeah, you know what she was trying to say. I'm trying to make it. You know what I mean? Whatever. You know, it just it. it mm-hmm. I didn't take exactly. care of my business. I I, I was not on top of mm-hmm. uh, things the way that I should have been. And so, um, basically, um, when I met the the, the other person, um, we you know sent stuff to get to each other. And so I sent him what we know now. Uh, as a Millie and uh, what it was was um, I took um, it was a sample that basically I manipulated and made it what it is now and so he you know he and I kept you know going back and forth so he had me come by his house or something like that and I listened to it and I'm like okay well it's you know really, really no difference but okay cool again not on top of my business and you know, I would always sample my voice as well. You know, I may, you know, go, woody, 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 whatever, whatever, and then I sample it and, you know, slow it down or whatever the case is. And and by me not being on top of that, man, we, uh, once we got together and uh, he talked to me and he was like, man, are there any samples or whatever on that stuff? I'm like, man, no. You know, because again, I didn't take care of my business. I didn't care. Uh, well, it's not that I didn't care. I was care less. You know, and I would get samples from everywhere along with, you know, sampling my voice. And so basically, you know, when he asked me, uh, were there any samples on it? I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's me. That's my voice. You know, so, you know, big mistake, huge mistake, because it, it would basically come back to haunt me not taking care of my business. And so that's why I said earlier, um, you have to protect yourself from yourself. And in this situation, it ended up being that I was my worst enemy. And so time went on and um, we kind of lost contact. And um, he, uh, well, when my cousin came down from Chicago to Atlanta and he, you know, I was playing some music for him and stuff and Amelia was one of them because I I had an original beat, but then he changed the drums, and so nothing else, you know, the, nothing else was changed. And so um, when he came right. down, I let him hear it, and I let him go back to Chicago with uh, the the record. I mean, well, the, the music, and he played it for one of my cousins, and uh, my cousin was like, "Man, that's a Lil Wayne beat," and my cousin was like, "No, it ain't. What are you talking about? This this Chucky and you know." The other dude, you know, they, they're like, nah, nah, nah. Mm-hmm. So he went out to the car, got the music, brought it in, played it. It was a Millie. And so he got online. Wow. <laughs> a Millie was everywhere. So he called me and he was like, Chucky, man, Little Wayne is on your, on the beat. Wait, what? What, what? You need to go online right now. So 
<laughs> I'm like, okay, I jump online and I look, a milli is everywhere. It had been on I probably it was on mixtapes for months. Mm. And it was all online produced by this other producer, you know, and he you know, his mm. tag is all on it. And I'm like, wait a minute, what the, what just happened? So I called my attorney. Just so happened we had the same attorney. I met her through somebody else. And um, when I got down, when when I got on the phone with her, she was like, okay, well, come on in, come on in, come on in. I need you to come in. So I was kind of rushed in. And I uh, went in and she was like, yeah, this is what's going on. And such, 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 such. It was, you know, uh, so um, I'm, I'm uh, representing him. I'm not representing you. And I'm like, whoa. Huh? She was like, yeah. So... Yeah. <laughs> She was like my first real entertainment <laughs> lawyer, and I trust you know I, I I trusted her. Yeah. Um, but when that happened, I should have gotten other legal representation immediately, but I didn't. Uh, another huge mistake. Um, and I, I keep saying these are these are the things that take place, and so. Um, when you know I chose to go with her I mean I signed a document saying that she wasn't representing me she was representing him and all that and um, so then it, during our conversation uh, she was like okay well this is all getting done and all that so uh, are, there, are there any samples on there uh, is there anything and again I hadn't taken care of my business I was careless you know I was like no no it, it, it wasn't so um, that happened, and during this time, though, you know, I was calling, you know, people letting them know. And well, let me say this: the other part, it was supposed to say on the insert because uh, I went in and I signed a co-production agreement. We did a co-production agreement for the record, and um, it was supposed to say additional elements produced by Chalo, and they made sure that that wasn't on there because that was sort of what was agreed upon. Um, then it just said additional element, Chalo. So, um, time went on. Uh, Millie came out, and uh, basically, I was going around, you know, telling people I co produced it because that's what it is. I'm getting phone calls, man, you ain't do nothing, man. You just you just gave me a little sample, man. You ain't. And I'm like, wait a minute, huh? Huh? What do you mean? I, I, if I didn't exist, this record wouldn't exist. Right. So, right. I had to go through the that part of it. And so I'm at the studio one day, and I, I get a phone call from the attorney. She's like, uh, Chalo, there's uh, been a copyright infringement. I'm like, copyright infringement? She was like, yeah. They said uh, that this sample came from, uh, that the vocal sample came from the vampire remix of I Lost My Wallet and El Segundo. And I'm like, well, I know, yeah, I knew, I knew I, I lost my wallet in El Segundo, but I never heard of the Vampire Remix. And then she mimicked right. the original way that it was before I, you know, I manipulated it and made it, you know, what it is on a Millie today. And I said, oh my God. Yes, I remember. I'm, I, I, man, I was floored. I was crushed, man. I, and it, it messed me up because I knew that it was my lack of taking care of business that came back and bit me right in the behind. You know, told my, you know what up, man. And uh, mm. uh, so I said, okay, yeah, I, I got it. So I tell you what, just tell everybody that it was me. Tell everybody that it was my fault. I made the mistake. I'll deal with it. And she basically said, it doesn't work like that. See, they really didn't want people to know my actual role in the record. They wanted, you know, right, the attention right. to, you know, because the first thing people would be asking is, well, what do you do? You know, and um, so right. I had to, uh, you know, I, I had to deal with that. And, you know, honestly, man, that being uh, the situation I had to, when it comes to the business part, that's one part. But then the other part was the family part. Because I had to take that home, right? And uh, it affected my 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 whole life, my marriage, you know, a lot of that. And um, so, 
I ended up being uh, faced with being sued. And uh, we ended up um, basically not, nobody got sued, but we had to, you know, deal with it. I ended up getting, you know, nothing as far as publishing. Um, they gave the other guy, you know, some or whatever the case is. But at the end of the day, I couldn't blame anybody. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be like, man, well, he did this or this person did that and all that other stuff. I, the only person that I could blame was me. Now, yeah, the other guy went on to, you know, pretty much take my sound. I mean, I remember getting a phone call from Will one day. Hey, man, why did you, why, why is this dude always, his, his tag on, on your sound, man? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about, man? He's like, man. And I think Will sent me something yeah. and it was Diva. By Beyonce, he was. I was like, "Oh yeah. my goodness!" Right, right after that, you know, yeah. and then it just kept happening and it kept happening and it kept happening, you know. Um, so then you had six or seven come out and all this other stuff produced by the guy, you know, and um, it was a painful thing. And this is another reason why I implore, you know, the the, the producers to really take care of their business because there's. Um, there's kind of like carnage, you know, after you make a mistake of that magnitude. I mean, to be honest with you, man, uh, during that time period, man, Lil Wayne uh, was at the top of his game. Um, he was a, he won a Grammy that following, you know, year. And I remember because, because I had pretty much kind of been blackballed and so many things, it was, whatever was being said about me and all this other stuff. Um, I had to get money, man, and I didn't, and people, the phone calls kind of, they, they stopped, you know, and they all went to him, and, uh, dude, during that time, my mother had gotten sick, and I was working at McDonald's, I was flipping burgers when, one, when Wayne won the Grammy, now my name was there, I couldn't go around telling people who I was at this place, and then I couldn't let my peers know what I had to do to get some money. You know, so you're talking about pain. That type of situation, man, is so unfortunate because it's like, you know, you were a you were a part of one of the biggest hip hop records in history. Like that record had, I think it was uh, written somewhere that that record was remixed and and the most remixed record in the history of hip hop. Like it is. more people jumped on that record and did their version of it than. Uh, it's incredible to hear that, bro. So, and just for the people people uh, listening at home and listening in their cars or whatever, um, of course, Wikipedia you can't trust one hundred percent. But it, but I see on here that you're credited as a writer. So, is it a situation where because there there was a a, a, a sample thing where they kind of took your portion of, of what the publishing would have been? That's for you? right. That's, That's right. You know what? That's though, right. Man, you know, here, here's the unfortunate thing and, about. It. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the thing is, is that though. It was my actual manipulation of it because what you hear is, is basically what I did to the sample, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, I could have possibly gotten maybe some type of melody or whatever because I, you know, what you hear. But it comes down to um, them having the upper hand in that situation and me putting myself in that situation. But um, so they were able to pretty much decided decided who they wanted to uh, give money to so basically right. it was them because um, it was uh, Tribe Call Quest and the other producer right. um, and that's who they decided to uh, go with and you know wow. I, I couldn't do anything but accept that and you know and now everybody lost I mean he lost I lost you know I mean they didn't you know um, but because of what took place, you know, um, I had no leg to stand on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people get caught in copyright infringement stuff all the time. Um, but it just turns out that in my situation, uh, it was on a bigger scale. And, um, you know, I had to really, you know, just deal with what I was, you know, facing, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think the unfortunate thing is is the fact that uh, I guess they're not, not crediting you crediting you as a co-producer because you know again from my research it looks like the producer uh, should get like a producer royalty 
uh, like a producer point at least uh, from the record as well. So, and I know the producer, original guy that was credited, ended up suing, suing uh, the record label, and I guess got a settlement. And you know, you which would, is crazy. Like I mean, not uh, not to drop bombs on the attorney member, but obviously that particular attorney wasn't very good anyway. So it doesn't seem ethical. <laughs> it doesn't seem ethical, right? Well, you know, I mean, like, everybody. in that situation, <laughs> uh, that that record. You know, a lot of a lot of things happen with the Carter Three. You know, yeah. and you know, uh, in that situation, I I wasn't a part of uh, the um, the point system on that because I ended up working out something with uh, the producer. You know what I mean? And so he ended up with the points, not me. You know what I mean? And uh, I really they didn't. Again, it was it was set up where. I was not supposed to be considered a producer of the record, even though there was a co-production agreement. It wasn't supposed, they didn't want that part to really come out. And again, man, uh, you know, it's not about, you know, bashing other people. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. and that, and that, that that's uh, the only thing that I can really speak to and, and speak to the audience about is to make sure that, you take care of your business. I don't want anybody on the face of this earth to experience what I've experienced. Yeah. And, man, and you know, if the, I can help in any kind of way. Yeah. Uh, un unfortunately, though, man, this is a reoccurring story, man. It's not like you, you're you on an island by yourself. Um, I just, you know, I, I hate it because I know you personally and I, I hate it for anybody. But, of course, you know, being that I was there when it all happened and. I remember yeah. the excitement that was was brewing over the just the possibility of them, uh, you know, uh, you know, clearing up the business on it and hopefully it benefiting you had me. It motivated me in so many ways during that time of my career as well. And I, I just think, uh, you know, for our listeners, I think the, the, the biggest thing to take from this is, you know, don't get caught up in the hype of what's happening. Slow down like slow down and really pace yourself when it comes to um you know getting your business in order you know the thing is like like with the way your particular situation played out you know finding out that something is out afterwards really had had you had someone help you or be there to be real with you that really could have played in your favor of uh, it could have. It could have. Just because they had already put the record out and they didn't take care of the business ahead of time, which means you really could have ended up with some great leverage. But I know, like you said, it wasn't it wasn't really your fault as much as it was just, hey, man, you know, I went from being out here trying to get on to all of a sudden having the biggest record in the country. And I'm affiliated with at the time an extremely popular and dope producer who was winning at the time it, it, i mean I, I i see all of the plays being uh reasonable for your thought pattern you know what i'm saying but at the same time you know if it's anything you know i just want our listeners to know that listen the hype is what destroys 90 percent of us out here we want to be a part of the elite group of producers and and, and musicians so bad that we forget that you know there's a there's there's your lifeline on the line you know and it, it could really destroy just about everything man and i think that you you um you're you, you have a great testimony when it comes to what could happen i mean i pray for you all the time i mean you know this show is you know this show is for people like yourself myself and all of our listeners who make music you know, I just don't want those unfortunate circumstances for anybody. Like, this show isn't designed to bash anybody. You know, no one's specifically mad at anyone in these situations other than, uh, like you said, maybe we should just take our time and, and, and make sure we're doing the right things when we're in these positions. Not you know? be our own worst enemy. Yeah, not sometimes. be our own worst enemy, man. Do so, you? Yeah. I was going to ask, um, you know, being that you were... Uh, accredited writer did you still get your platinum plaques what about the grammy nomination like as far as yeah i got i got my uh platinum plaque and when it came to the grammy uh so for me to receive the grammy you have to have been on um i think uh you either had to have been on the album of the year mm -hmm. yeah it's either yeah. album of the year or you would have had to have produced over 51 percent of a record that you know received the grammy meaning you know if 
This, right. It was a particular genre, you know, and the, that album won. And in this situation, it was the single. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So he won a Grammy for his performance yeah. on a Millie because nothing had been, you know, heard of. Right, right, right. So, uh, so heard, basic, heard of, so like Bangladesh, that. or I'm sorry, well, Bangladesh didn't did he didn't receive a Grammy on that song either, did he? No. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. I th I think there's always. You know the Grammy winning Grammys always has like a really weird twist to it. You know what I'm saying? Um, well, I say this not that I know of. I know when I contacted the people, they told me, you know, that these were the rules. So yeah, yeah. I mean, if he had a I way mean, around I, the rules, I think you or, may be right now. I mean, you know, it really doesn't matter to to me. I just think I was just wondering, you know, because I think that's good information for our listeners as well that they they all have to understand that there are rules to winning grammys as well and like categories don't necessarily mean everyone's going to get a grammy yeah. as much as no. it, you know like you said it would only count like if it's album of the year and a whole bunch of other different things that could go down yeah. um what what you know if you could sum it up in a few words man like what advice being that you you i mean because honestly man it's you know, I hate to say this, but like it's been bad for you in a certain extent. But let me tell you, man, your story is so real that I want to yeah. say that it is a positive. So, well, yeah, and then he had other good moments too. I was gonna say like uh, the drop song, "A Rich Boy," uh, mm -hmm. went to number one on a, on the R and B hip hop singles chart. You right, know, a right. year later, um, how did that come about, and, and, and what? Um, how was that experience? Yeah, the drop record. That was a pretty big record. So I can give you that one. So with drop, um. My attorney was like, okay, look, we're going to do everything the right way. <laughs> and this is, you know, and so, so, so this is what happened. So, um, I was like, okay, fine. So we ended up going and I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, we ended up, you know, doing everything, uh, with, um, rich boy and, um, Interscope and, um, what happened was I had purchased this CD called Ethnic Russian Vocals uh, some nice. years before. And, um, you know, I had the, the CD and the information. And so uh, when um, Polo and, you know, it come to me so we could do the record and do the business, um, I made sure that I had all of the information, you know, that they needed. Well, it turned out that the company, from what we understood, we, they, we couldn't find the, uh, the person who owned, you know, the company. Even though I had bought the CD and all this other stuff, um, they, we, we couldn't find them. So we had to clear it or whatever the case is. And so uh, Universal was like, okay, well, we'll find them. And I'm like, okay, you know, well, uh, you know, this, here you go. Here goes every... All of the information and all this other stuff. So here I ended up getting my money bullshit. and money. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm glad. That's why I said I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> so I ended up getting my front end money. And um, then I ended up, my attorney, <laughs> I, I don't know why this happened, but we ended up doing a, uh, a memo deal with Rich Boy. And uh, during that time, there were a lot of things going on in his personal life. And uh, so what should have happened, though, right then, is that that deal, the memo deal, shouldn't have been done with the artist. The memo mm -hmm. deal should have been done with the production company mm -hmm. or the label directly. Right. Right. But, you know, we, the attorneys were like, look, you know, let's just get something in writing so that we can, you know, finish the process. I'm like, okay, cool. And it's my new attorney, all that other stuff. And uh, so we got the deal. They sent me the check, and, um, and I took the files and uh, did the paperwork. Fine. So um, they said that they would, you know, locate the person or they'll, they'll find them. Now, they weren't supposed to release drop or sell drop in any way unless you know you get the permission from the the person who you gotta find you know you gotta deal with the, the, the business you right, know right, the, right. the person who owns the sample right. you know and just to clear it up just to make sure even though i bought it still make sure that there are no issues well it turns out they start playing it you know and all this other stuff cool my uh my um Attorney at that time just said, "Look, just don't don't collect anything from it now or whatever. Just just let it play out until you know they find the person." 
Well, come to find out, man, years later, um, that, you know, the company had been uh, receiving royalties and selling it the whole time. Mm. And um, they cut me out wow. again. Now, even though my, my tag is on there, you know, I will get full credit for producing drop. I mean, it's my beat. You know, I created the, the beat, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, they were able to skate around the business of it. And uh, I, what happened was, there's a lady by the name of Ebony Bones out of the UK that stopped blowing up on the record. And um, she sampled drop. And so she contacted me and was like, okay, well, we need to get it cleared from you. And I had to tell her, look, I don't own the sample, but, you know, we'll have to, because what it was, she was putting it out, and Universal came after her. And they were saying, well, you're in, you know, in breach of copyright and fragrance. She said, well, let me call Charlo. And so then my attorney got on them and all that, and, he's, and they were like, okay, well, so many words, you made the beat. Now, this is something that I want everybody to hear. All of you producers, everybody, mm -hmm. you got to stop saying I made the beat. When it comes to the court of law and you say that you made the beat, that means you made a drum beat. Whoa. You have to say I made the composition. Whoa. Mm. Free game. If you put down in black and white and anywhere and somebody's coming after you or trying to take something from you, well, look, I made the beat. They'll be like, oh, okay. You're and then they'll be able to go back court wise and say, well, he said he made the beat. And according to the court of law, it's the beat is a drum beat. And a drum beat, unless it's an SI form, is non copyrightable. Whoa. That's crazy. That's crazy. So basically, they didn't, the, the fact that that girl um, sampled the song kind of brought it brought it to light. That It brought it to the, and that's how I found out they had been collecting, collecting and all this other yeah. stuff. That's what, wow. yeah. And, you know, one thing, you know, with it being on Earl Sweatshirt and all this other stuff, it, it boosted my name. Right. You know, so that, it, it helped me in that regard as far as, you know, Childish Gambino, Kid Cudi, all these other people. But, yeah. um, J -Rock. you know, um, but there was no, you know, real monetary value from that particular situation. And then when, you know, my lawyer contacted them and all this other stuff, they were like, okay, take us to court. Jeez, man. Because they know that's just not a winnable case and you got to have that long money to stay in there with them. That's right. Jeez, man. Wow. I mean, so go but, ahead and take, so go ahead and take your money, go ahead and take your your credit and take um go ahead and live with that yeah and i mean it could have been a number of things that happened when they contacted the sample company they could have said okay we'll buy it from you all right so we'll here's, here's a good question for you then man because like yeah. it's you know you you've been in two i mean bro you've been a part of two incredible records and you've also dealt with it's crazy i never thought we'd be having a conversation about other producers <laughs> doing producers dirty dog like this is a double up like it's and you know and I you know of course on this show we're not trying to enlighten anything crazy about other producers but it's just kind of it is kind of bringing to the forefront like I said we would probably open Pandora's box on this show but it just kind of makes it where it's like yo when dealing with other producers you know what I'm saying like there's a, also a need to be very careful about the approach that you make and make sure that um whatever attorneys you bring into this situation they need to be able to really look into the structure of these deals and make sure that it's fair enough you know because it's okay to accept things as they are like like you said if you agree to something you agree to it but on the other hand you know you don't want to be in a situation where you're working and people are using your stuff